What up, gang? This is Ken Zerk, Ken Zilling, Yazika Milligan, the villain for the trilogy, and we are back on Umi Naku no Naku Koro Ni. It is 12 p.m. the next day from the last episode. I've been fucking hooked on this game. I'm really trying to finish this, finish this first episode before I start recording anything else. So, I, man, because I've just been, I'm stuck on this shit right now. I'm not going to lie to you. Let's get back in this bitch. Less than 19, more than 18. The witch exists somewhere in that X. Yeah, I was gonna shatter the fucking glass. Shit always scares the fuck out of me. My fault, I was looking at bad bitches on Twitter. The uncomfortable atmosphere continued even after those two left. It was thick with the idea that, hold on, I gotta see that shit again. It was bad as fuck. The uncomfortable atmosphere continued even after those two left. It was thick with the idea that simply thinking about the corporate's identity would be the same as deciding whom to suspect. That begun to feel like the uh, feel like discussion of the case it was itself taboo. So no one mentioned the case, at least out loud. However, those thoughts were what filled our minds. All that we couldn't say aloud made our heads feel like they were going to explode. So at least on the outside, the parlor had once again remained its calm, regained its calm mood. Everything was settled, or some shit. Everything seemed settled. I don't fucking know. Feels like the rain's gotten a little lighter. Still pouring down. Even if it did stop, there's no boat on this island. But it'd be nice if the boat came quickly tomorrow. I've had enough of this western mansion vacation. Mom, when will the boat come tomorrow? Normally the boat would take them back. Normally the boat would take them back would arrive at three o'clock today. They probably sent us a phone call that said that they would come after the typhoon pack, but unfortunately the phones aren't working. But they aren't children over there. They were told to both drop off and collect our guests. So they'll most likely arrive first thing tomorrow morning. Probably about nine o'clock, I believe. It was completely black outside. When I looked at the clock, I realized it was just past seven. I was starting to get hungry. In the kitchen, Kumasawa was cooking enthusiastically. She had laid out a variety of dishes, and while they didn't match the level of Goda's artful cooking, they were still quite gorgeous. It was an act of kindness from Kumasawa, who was trying to enliven everyone's low spirits with some food. Kumasawa wasn't nearly as talented as a professional cook like Gota, but she was far from unskilled. On the contrary, since she had been brought up in a fishing village, the simple food she created was sometimes highly praised. Kanon arranged the food Kumasawa had finished creating on plates under her direction. Kanon had also helped in the kitchen sometimes, but since he was rarely placed in that role, he was slightly awkward even though he tried his best. Self-conscious about the fact that he couldn't cleverly arrange the food, Kanon's expression darkened slightly. But Kumasawa smiled as though everything was fine. <laughs> oh, it's arranged beautifully. Kanon, aren't you skilled? If it had been Shannon, it would look even more beautiful. Kanon stopped arranging the food for a bit and hung his head. Shannon was the one who always assisted Kumasawa in her cooking. Tonight, Kanon was doing it instead, and he remembered Shannon's face and her brutal end. He grimaced. Forget that for now. Genji smoked kindly to Kanon as he advanced the pond. Nanjo had escaped the parlor once the mood had grown sour, and Genji had become his opponent in a game of chess upon Nanjo's request. I will forget it for now. Indeed. That is probably for the best. Genji purposely refrained from facing Kanon as he spoke. He did so because he understood that it might make things tougher on Kanon if he noticed that someone was looking in his eyes. Nanjo also understood that and held back any thoughtless words. I wonder where Kinzo is gone. I hope that he is safe, but... I do not know. However, I believe everything has proceeded as the master had hoped and arranged for. The distrust that would exceed my role as furniture and service of the master. Aren't you scared, Genji? I am frightened that something bad will occur again tonight. 
I have nothing to be afraid of. I serve the Yoshirimiya family and that is all. Nanjo sighed through his nose and made a carefully considered move. Nanjo was very slightly dubious. Could Genji possibly be thinking that he'd be, that he'd be left out of this? He couldn't even imagine what was happening inside this mansion, but he definitely couldn't deny the possibility that Kenjo had devised something. If you liken this island to chess, Kenzo had opened the game, and as a result, six pieces had been defeated. Could it be that Genji was calm because he, under because he believed he alone was on the outside of the chessboard and therefore safe? Nanjo thought about it. Isn't, it every isn't everyone just a piece on, the on this chessboard? lined up equally without any exceptions? Wasn't even Genji, who had gained more trust, more of Kenzo's trust than anyone. No, who was confident of his position as Kenzo's only close friend. Just another one of the pieces laid out on the chessboard? Genji, Genji I am truly frightened about tonight. I hope with all my heart that we will be safe when tomorrow morning comes. Nigga, we are not gonna be safe. Genji's dead! The guest room Ava and Hideyoshi moved into had originally been built to house guests before the guest house's construction. So until a few years ago, I stayed in these rooms every family conference and were very familiar with them. This room was just like a room at a hotel with a bedroom and a bathroom. But even though they were still shut in, it was far more comfortable than the parlor. Yeah, buddy. Guess it's true you can relax more when you're alone with your family. Maybe it'd be better if everyone else also shut themselves in the guest rooms and locked the doors. Not so he said that no one can leave the parlor throwing her weight around. I'm sure no one will be able to talk back. She's always been treated so coldly. To know that Nissan's dead, she's getting excited about finally having so much power. Seriously, how shameless can she be? Come now, don't say that. Nasui's doing pretty well. No need to jump on her like that. And about that receipt earlier, you went too far. Come on. If I hadn't said it there, there wouldn't be another good time to say it. Ava sulking cutely and looking at the television, sat alongside Hideyoshi was laying on the bed. Still, we haven't been alone like this for quite some time. You're right. Come to think of it, both you and I have gotten pretty old. Since George was born, everything's gone by in the blink of an eye. It really has. I wonder if we were too hasty in having a child. Ava's eyes looked like they were staring off into the distance. Yes, she had thought of it as a once in a lifetime chance. Even a fuck? Her older brother Kraus had been unable to father her child for quite some time. Six years passed after his marriage to Natsuhi without any signs of pregnancy, which didn't please Kenzo at all. Ava herself had thought that, since her name would be moved outside through Shiramiya registry, when she got married anyway, it didn't matter whether a successor to the headship was born or not. And then one day, she had a heavenly revelation, or maybe it was the whisperings of the devil that had listened to her in greed, listened to her in her greed. If she could give birth to a successor first, wouldn't she be able to remain in the Shiramiya registry? If things went well, might she have a chance to inherit the family herself? When she proposes to Hideyoshi, he had approved of it instantly. This wasn't because Hideyoshi also had greedy thoughts. For Hideyoshi, who had no close relatives, there was a chance for him to feel once more the long-forgotten thing called family. So when they got married, he hadn't fussed over which last name they were to keep, and had quickly agreed to have his name entered in the Ashurimiya family register. It hadn't been easy to persuade Kenzo, but as his daughter, Ava knew Kenzo's personality well. So by choosing the time when Kenzo was most dissatisfied with Natsuhi, she was magnificently able to make him accept Hideyoshi as, a, as an adopted son-in-law. Looking at Hideyoshi, who had achieved success after starting from nothing, Kenzo might have seen a little bit of himself. 
He quickly grew to like Hideyoshi and approved his transfer into the Ushiramiya Registry. George would eventually be, be, become the successor to the Ushiramiya family. They had raised him strictly with that purpose in mind. He had been worth their while and had grown into a fabulous young man who didn't disappoint no matter where he went. That was why he had not been permitted to fall in love with a servant like Shannon. So when she learned that Shannon was dead and the engagement was now invalid, though part of her had been shocked by, the, by her gruesome crime, part of her had also been relieved that her dear George wouldn't be stolen by some servant girl. I have hated Kraus since long ago. He was so full of himself, always swaggering around. So proud that he would one day become the head. So I wanted to get back at him. Wasn't that just a, was that just a childish emotion? But in the end, that emotion guided my entire life. If that had been all, then it would have been fine. But because of that emotion, I got you and George involved. I used you. Ava, don't blame yourself for that. Hideyoshi got up and held Ava's shoulder. She could feel a warm understanding from him. Well, I reached the halfway point in my life long ago. But you know, I have absolutely no regrets about how I've lived my life. Not one. I think that since I've been with you, Ava, I've been able to relish an enjoyable life that other men never will. After I lost my relatives in the war, you reminded me what the warmth of family is. So I'm grateful to the Oshiramiya family and think of it as my only one. In this life I've led with you, not a single thing's been wasted. It's really been a fun life up till today. Thank you, darling. Ava hung her head, burying her face in Hideyoshi's chest. Probably no one in the parlor could even imagine that this side of Ava existed. I'm the one who should be thanking you. Until today, there hasn't been a single day I've regretted being with you. Until today. Hold on, I'm gonna be real. I don't really like the way Hideyoshi's talking. Because he's talking as if shit's about to end now. And that's kind of scaring the fuck out of me. Me too. I'm so glad to have you by my side. This shit is too heartwarming. Something bad's gonna happen. George is already a fine adult. Even if I don't look out for him, he's a man who can do his job well on his own. I wonder. Around New Year's, do you want to go spend some time in the Maldives? Just us, no one else. No way. Aren't you always saying that you're too busy for spending a New Year's concert you don't even sleep? None of that this New Year's. I won't read New Year's cards. I'll just stay quiet and check to see if I've won the New Year's lottery. It sure be nice if we won a color TV this year. No way. I don't want to waste time checking the lottery while at the Maldives. Then none of that either. How does it sound? Just the two of us. Taking it easy like we were newlyweds, just before George was born. Yes. In that case, fine. I hear the Maldives are wonderful. An island with nothing on it, surrounded by beautiful coral reefs and cottages lined up over the water. Oh yeah, they're about to fucking die. Like when we were newlyweds, you say, starting when? As soon as I finished up some business, I won't know till I ask a travel agency, but probably before New Year's Eve. No way, right now. I want to go right now. Ava nagged at his lips in a peevish yet flirtatious manner. The only sound that filled the room were the distant voice of the announcer on the news which Hideyoshi had left on, and the obnoxious pounding of the rain against the window. Oh, she's about to get dick. Hey, W, man. W, you know? They've been married for all that time and they still love each other? They're still trying to pipe? That's fucking W. Love a good marriage. When there was a knock at the door, Genji entered. There was a knock at the door and Genji entered. Madam, dinner has been prepared. Will you eat in here again? Yes. Have it brought here. Is Dr. Nanjo still in the kitchen? 
Yes. He has said he wishes to carefully deliberate over his next move. Do not worry, he is with the other servants. Genji's good enough at chess to be grandfather's opponent. I hear he's even better than Dr. Nanjo, right? That's right. Long ago he played against me, but he must have let me win. Maria, sounds like it'll be time to eat soon. But look at you, you've been watching TV all day long, you still haven't gotten bored. I'm always watching TV, so I'm fine. Uh, Maria sure is a TV kid. Food's coming, so we have to clean up the table. Earlier, we had torn several pages out of Maria's notebook. There was now a mess where everyone had been drawing together. Jessica began to clean began cleaning that up quickly. Still, everyone here really can draw. I never guessed. Genji. Genji. Ask Eva and Hideyoshi whether they'd at least like to have dinner with us. Although they would probably turn us down. Certainly. First father and now Eva. It's quite hard to gather everyone to the Yoshua Mia dinner table. Not till we felt her headache start throbbing again and lightly held her temples. Come over here, baby girl. Come over here, baby girl. Look. Ain't no headaches around here, I got you. Stop. I would treat Natsu, he's so right. The distance from the kitchen to the parlor wasn't that great, so Genji had gone and come back by himself, but the guest room was a little farther away. Natsu had warned him to avoid being alone whenever possible, and just now, Natsu had also admonished him, saying it would be better if he held a little more concern for his, for his safety. Kanon accompanied Genji, and the two of them went to visit Ava and Hideyoshi in their guest room. Genji knocked on the door. Ava, Hideyoshi, dinner has been prepared. He waited a short while for them to come out, but there was no response. Genji, look at this. Kanon pointed under the door. A western envelope had been inserted under it. Normally when something was inserted this way, it'd be interpreted as a message from someone outside to someone in the room. So since this might be a private note meant for Ava and Hideyoshi, it was not something that Kanon and Genji were supposed to take interest in. But this western envelope was one of Kenzo's, the same kind as the one Maria had taken out last night to surprise everyone with. There can be no mistake. It is one of the master's envelopes. Or could it be? Even though this was one of Kenzo's envelopes, the letter Mario read aloud the previous night hadn't come from Kenzo. Genji continued knocking a little harder and had called out in a loud voice. Eva! Eva! It is Genji! Are you, are you there? Please answer Eva! But there was no response from inside. Sometimes, when the servants went to call some guests for a meal, the guests would be sleeping so deeply that they wouldn't wake up. In times like this, the servants would stick a letter in the door to show that it was time to come out and leave the guests be. But despite that, Genji beat even harder on the door and called out Ava's name. However, there was no answer. Yo, kick that bitch open! Kanon stuck his ear to the door and held his breath and listened for any sounds coming from inside. I hear something that sounds like a television, but I don't sense anyone. The room might be empty. Genji took out a handkerchief and careful not to touch it with his bare hands, gently pulled out the envelope that had been stuck under the door. It was sealed with a deep red sealing wax. Without a doubt, the mark on the sealing wax had come from the Oshiramiya family's head ring. Ava! Ava! Please answer! Are you still in your room? But there was still no answer. There was a chance that the two were aimlessly walking around the mansion. This was the home Ava had grown up in. There was plenty of reason to think she had gone out on a casual stroll. Genji groped around in his pocket and pulled out a bundle of keys, which contained the key that would open the guest room. Kana also understood what this meant. They would sometimes unlock the door so they could go in and do things like make the beds but only after they made sure the guests were out. To unlock the door for any other reason, and especially do so when there was a chance the guests hadn't given permission 
and might still be in there, was an accident of becoming of a servant. But Ganty had decided, if the only problem had been that his knock hadn't received the reply, he wouldn't have to go this. He wouldn't have gone this far. But the envelope under the door was doubtless the one of Kinzo's, or rather, one of the Western envelopes of the Ushirimiya family had. After last night, the sender of this envelope could be someone other than Kinzo. If this letter had been sent by someone else, Ava, my apologies. Allow me to enter your room. After giving that final notice, Genji stuck one of the keys from the bundle into the keyhole. There was the sign of the door unlocking, and after he slowly turned the knob, he started slowly opening the door. Light seeped through the crack of the door. Were they in the room? Or had they forgotten to turn out the lights? Clank. It was the sign of the door chain being pulled tight. The chain had been secured. The chain couldn't be secured from the outside to so prove that they were in the room. The sound of voices from the, on the TV seeped out of the room. The lights, the chain, and the TV. All of these things made it clear they were in the room, but there was no sign of them. Genji called to Ava once again through the crack of the door, but there was no answer. Genji, what should we do? As part of their job, the servants were able to unlock almost any lock in the mansion. But they had no way to open a door with a chain. They could break that shit! Rip that shit off! The only way to get the get by the chain was to cut it. That certainly was not permitted as part of a servant's usual work. A creepy chill had already rushed up their backs. Kanon held his breath again and tried to send someone to the door, but even so he was not able to sense anyone. I will call madam in return. Kanon, cut the chain. Y yes! As Kanon hurried away to get a cutting tool, Genji called him to a stop. Wait, Kanon! Return to the kitchen and take Kumasawa with you. You must not act alone. Yes, certainly. It looked like Kana was wondering why he had to do something so troublesome in the middle of this urgent situation. But Genji had said it out of weariness. He didn't care what happened to himself. But in the worst case scenario, he didn't want anything to happen to Kana. In the kitchen, Kumasawa was piling food on the serving cart. And Nanja was waiting for Genji, apparently to show him a move he'd finally thought up that might turn the tables on him. But Genji's appearance immediately told him that something was wrong. Oh, what has happened, Genji? Dr. Nanja, my apologies, but allow this match to be suspended for the time being. Kanon, take care of the chain. Kumasawa, stop setting up dinner for now and accompany Kanon. I will go over to the matter. If you would come with me, Dr. Nanja. Has something happened? Genji took Nanjo, who still didn't know what was going on, and quickly left the kitchen. Kumasawa, my apologies, but please come with me. What has happened, Kana? Kumasawa said almost the exact same thing as Nanjo, unable to take in the situation and chase after Kana, who had flown out into the hallway. Taking Kumasawa with him, Kanon went to his storage room and looked through all the tools packed in toolboxes and hanging all over the walls, trying to find something that could be used to cut the chain. What are you looking for? Let me help too. We're cutting a door chain. Where was that large wire cutter? A door chain? Why would you do something like that? The chain in Ava and Hideyoshi's room. Even though they should be inside, they didn't answer when we called them. It took Kumasawa some time to figure out how cutting the chain and Ava not answering were connected, but she did realize that this was an urgent situation. That one would probably do the trick. Kanan took down a very large wire cutter that had been hanging on the wall. It was called a cutter, but maybe it'd be easier to understand if we said it was shaped like a large pair of pliers. Kanan remembered being warned that this dangerous tool could easily cut through one of your fingers. Kanan took that and rushed up the stairs. He already knew instinctively, he should fight for every minute, every second to open it quickly. Or perhaps, it was already 
Please wait, Connor. Hurry! Kumasawa eventually caught up with him, gasping for breath with both hands on her knees. When Kanon changed the grip on the wire cutters and looked up at the door, he let out an ah, struck speechless. What is this? Kumasawa screamed weakly, her face pallid. That was no surprise, because right there on the door, just like the magic circle that had been drawn on the shutter to the rose garden, there was another eerie shape drawn with the blood-like paint. However, this would be odd to call this one a magic circle, because unlike what most people would expect, it wasn't a circle with shapes drawn inside it. It was a slightly more complicated geometrical shape. However, those strange out those strange characters filling in the gaps which weren't from the alphabet were the same kind as the ones on the magic circle on the shutter. But the thing that had struck Khan on speeches was how eerie the magic circle was. It was that something like this hadn't been here a short while ago. First he had taken a trip back to the kitchen. After that he'd gone to the storage room to grab the tool and headed right back. Put those together and it couldn't have been more than five minutes. How could someone add something this creepy during that period of time? And as though it had just been drawn, almost like the door itself was bleeding, several unsettling vertical lines slowly dripped down getting longer and longer. <laughs> Kumasawa's knees gave away and she sank down on the spot. If Kumasawa hadn't done this first and Kana surely would have wanted to. Beatrice! It's the work of Beatrice! How horrid, how horrid! Kanon gulped and readied the wire cutter and approached the door. He didn't want to get close to this disturbing magic circle, and he really didn't want to touch a steadily dripping substance that looked like blood. But if he didn't get close, he wouldn't be able to cut the chain. Fighting this cold feeling, he gulped again, and after gathering his courage, he went even closer, putting the wire cutter up against the chain. He then pressed with all his strength, managing to cut through the chain far more easily than he'd anticipated. The cut chain fell into two separate parts, which continued to clang as they swayed back and forth. Kanon! There's an envelope by your feet! And isn't that the master's? It looked like Kumasawa had also noticed the western envelope at the bottom of the door and that the sealing wax had been sealed with the head's ring. Kanon hesitated for just a second over whether he should open the letter first or check inside the room, but he eventually decided on fulfilling his original purpose. Kanon pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket. This was so he wouldn't leave fingerprints on the door. If his worst fears were realized, the police would want to investigate this room too. He slowly pushed the door open. He was able to more clearly hear the sound of the television, which had been seeping out faintly this whole time. Ava, Ava! Ava was lying face up on the bed. On the bed with the shoes still on? Kumasawa, who had fearfully entered after Kanon, who was hiding behind his back, screamed a short eek again when she saw Ava like that. Ava's shoes had been the first part of her that Kanon had seen. So the oddness of wearing shoes in the bed was the first thing to strike him. But when Ava's head shifted into his line of sight, Kanon couldn't help but let out a short scream like Kumasawa. Right in the middle of Ava's forehead, something had been... placed. Something was growing there. No. Right in the center of her forehead... was an old-fashioned knife. That or some weapon like it's sticking out. At the base of where it was stuck in, blood dripped down, staining the sheets on the other side bright red. Kumasawa's knees gave way once more, and she sank down on the floor. Her mouth kept flapping open and closed, but she couldn't even scream. Ava was dead, with some kind of weapon sticking out of her forehead. Both eyes were wide open, and the image of the person who killed her must have been burned into them. But the only mouth capable of naming that person had been shut for all eternity. 
Even though her forehead was the last place they wanted to look, they couldn't tear their eyes from it. Right there, the weapon was stuck into Ava's forehead, standing almost perfectly upright. And on the handle was a complicated design that you wouldn't expect to see on an ordinary weapon. That thing could be summed up with the word occult. It was a vulgar object, with a design that might have been of some demon. What about Hideyoshi? Hideyoshi! Hideyoshi! Ava was on top of her bed, but the other bed was empty. Where was Hideyoshi? After taking a backwards glance at Kumasawa was still on her knees and stupefied, he checked the bathroom just in case. At the moment he opened the door, he was greeted by steam and the sound of the shower. The bathroom was, a, was of, the, of, of the same familiar style as most hotel bathrooms. When taking a shower, a waterproof curtain was used to keep water from flying out. The waterproof curtain was half open, and lying tumbled in the bathtub was Hideyoshi, completely naked with both eyes open, and pointing right at Kanon, was a weapon with a demon-like design just stuck into his forehead. Since his head had been under the shower's hot water this whole time, his face wasn't half covered and filthy with blood like Ava's had been. But the sight of him dead was still taking a sh while still taking a shower was tragic enough. Just then they heard Natsui's voice coming from the hall. She was probably coming with Genji. Again with this graffiti? What about this letter? What does it say inside? I don't know, I haven't read it yet. We shouldn't touch it carelessly. The culprit's fingerprints might be left on it. We should hand it over to the police. They went out of their way to leave it here. I'm sure they wouldn't have left fingerprints. As Natsui said that, she picked up the envelope. And before checking the contents, she entered the room herself where she found Ava, dead. Ava! Madam, Hideyoshi is here too. This is truly atrocious. Kana, turn off the shower. Don't let this be more don't let this be any more pitiful than it needs to be. E e yes, ma'am. Kanon gripped his handkerchief and twisted the valve, turning off the shower. In the bathtub, a small jar of body soap had fallen with its cap off. Really looked like he'd been attacked while taking a shower. There was still a small splash of blood clinging to the white bathtub, and the combination of red and white made a horrible contrast. Dr. Nanjo. I understand. No signs of post-mortem lividity. Rigor mortis hasn't begun either. It would seem that an hour or so has passed since they were killed. But even so, how a weapon with such a short handle could do that to the skull, I cannot imagine. Nanjo checked their pulse and their pupils, making certain of their deaths once more. As Kanon watched his business-like treatment, he thought, Couldn't you tell at a glance that they were dead without doing all that? Nanjo thought about removing the weapon, but then decided it'd be better to preserve the seed and hand it over to the police, so he left it alone. But a close inspection of the base showed that it didn't have a blade. In fact, it was more conical than blade-shaped. He noticed that, rather than a knife, it was more like a short-handled spear something with a shape better suited for thrusting than slicing. Rather than a short spear, you might call it a thick ice pick. At any rate, after looking at this scene, no further words were needed to describe what sort of terrible purpose such eerily designed weapons were originally made for, nor was it necessary to explain how they carried out their function. Natsui, hoping to escape the repulsive steam filling the bathroom as soon as she could, covered her mouth with a handkerchief and dashed from the room. Just viewing their gruesome bodies for an instant had been enough to burn the image into her eyes. If she looked any longer, that image would surely remain in her vision for all eternity. The rising urge to vomit was exactly the same she'd had that morning at the gardening storehouse. For a while, Natsui couldn't help but stand with her back facing the guest room, fighting that sickness in her stomach. At any rate, we can't let the children... We can't let George see this room. Seal this room with all haste. 
Yes, we mustn't let them see. If George saw his parents in this brutal state. But they could all tell those fiercely racing footsteps in the hallway belonged to George, even before he came dashing into the room. George and the other children had been waiting in the parlor. However, when they saw Genji speak to Natsuhi, when they saw her turn pale and fly out of the parlor, they felt a sense of foreboding. And when they saw a large group of people gathered around the guest room, they were sure of it. Father! Mother! What is this? Another magic circle? Unable and Uncle Hideyoshi are safe, right? Hey, Kanon! What's this all about? Battler! Kanon didn't have anything to say. George's scream after he ran into the room told them everything they needed to know. Who, who did this? I'll kill you! I'll kill you! George, hang in there. Not so he touched George's shoulder with her hand, but he violently shook her off. George fell over beside Ava and buried his face in the bed in front of his mother's face, wailing. He had pounded on the bed with his fist over and over again. George, hang in there. Huh? Battler. Battler. Battler had his back against the wall of the hallway and was covering his eyes with his right hand and weeping without restraint. Horrible. That's horrible. He proposed to the girl he loved and lost her the next day. And on the same day, even his mom and dad were killed. It, isn't that too harsh? Of course, it's sad whenever anyone dies, no matter who it is. But to battle it, those left alone by the deaths of others were far more worthy of pity. Everyone here now had lost someone close to them. George wasn't the only one to be pitied. However, George's pain was far greater than everyone else's. Battle it. I know everyone dies sooner or later. If you're human, you'll eventually reach a time when you gotta fight the sorrow of losing somebody. But still, shouldn't that day be far in the future for Anaki? And shouldn't those deaths visit him at least one at a time? Horrible. It's too horrible. That fucking bitch! That bastard! Doesn't he have even a speck of human sympathy in him? Battler, don't cry, don't cry. Maya tried to comfort Battler in a mechanical sounding voice. Battler violently wiped his tears. Yeah. Damn it, I won't cry no more. Tears of regret, tears of sadness, I ain't shedding them shits no more. Ah, uh, it's all useless. This witch has got me back into a corner. I'm always on the defensive. And that's useless, it's all useless. I'll spin the chessboard around. That bastard probably thinks we'll be running scared like sheep until tomorrow before we try anything. But guess what? I'll spin it around, bitch. That bastard can't escape this island until tomorrow either. We won't be hiding away pissing ourselves. That bastard will. I'll expose you. You'll see, motherfucker. By tomorrow. Nah, fuck tomorrow. Tonight, nigga. Before the night's over, I'll be gripping you by your butt, by your collar, nigga. Fucking love this nigga, bro. Battle a real fucking love this nigga, bro. At any rate, we'll lock this room and leave everything as it is until the police come. No objections, I take it. Natsuhi announced it as though she didn't agree whether didn't care whether they agreed or not. If anyone had a right to object, it would have been George, but he looked as though he'd shed enough tears. George nodded slightly, still faced away from the others, and when he stood up, everyone else agreed too. 
Nice that we still hadn't opened the Western envelope, but they had family she picked up. Family had. But now that they decided to leave this room, she decided to unseal it in the parlor where everyone could watch. As soon as they walked out into the hallway to head back to the parlor, some of them immediately felt out of place, or maybe they sensed something, felt something out of place, or maybe they sensed something strange. Stinks? Ah, uh, did you notice it too, Maria? Seriously, what's that smell? It's awful. When everyone sniffed the air, they did notice a horrible burnt smell drifting through the hallway, one that none of them had smelled until then. I will quickly go check the kitchen. I'm sure I turned the flame off. After noticing a burnt smell, it was natural that Kumasawa, who had just been using the burner in the kitchen, suspected that her own slip-up had caused it. Kumasawa hastily dashed away. Kanon, go with Kumasawa. Do not let her be alone. Yes! After nodding at Genji's order, Kanon followed after her. He wasn't running, but as he followed her, he tried to search for the cause of the smell in other directions as well. Stinks! It truly is a stench that makes a nose wrinkle. However, that doesn't mean we could just open the window for ventilation. Natsui was reluctant to open the windows in a situation where self-defense was so important. Let us run the fan. I do not believe there will be any need to open the windows. George, is it okay if I talk to you? If it's about finding the culprit, then I have no problems. It seemed George had managed to climb out of the abyss of sorrow. All that filled his chest now was a quiet flame of hatred towards the culprit who had stolen the lives of the one he loved and his beloved parents. The chain for this room was set. What the fuck? The chain for this room was set. From what I could tell by looking at it, I'm positive that it couldn't be opened from the outside. In other words, this was a perfect closed room. That does seem to be the case. In the case of the Rose Garden storehouse, they might have sneaked the shutter's key out of the servant room. Or maybe they had a duplicate key. I can imagine many ways they could have done it. But this chain is different. Among generally used locking techniques, a chain is the simplest one to create a closed room with. Only a chain will block everyone coming from the outside as long as it isn't physically broken. So does that mean the culprit couldn't have gone in or out through the door? That's interesting. Just a few hours ago, I seem to remember everyone making a fuss over how to enter a room without using the door. Back then, we were all losing our cool, wondering how Grandfather had disappeared from his room. The receipt on Ava stuck in the door on a whim proved that the door had remained sealed. And since Aunt Natsuhi was the only person to enter or exit the, during that time, she was under suspicion. Aunt Ava proposed a theory about how Aunt Natsuhi might have thrown Grandfather out the window and left, the, and left by the door herself. But this door was much simpler. It was sealed from the inside by a door chain. The window had also been locked from the inside and the bodies had been inside the room. This time, it really had been, without exaggeration, a true closed room. That's right. If you include grandfather's disappearance, three cases have occurred, and all three times, the door has been the point of interest. The first was the shutter. There was a key in the servant room, and if we assume someone knew about that, this can't really be called a closed room. The next was the door sealed by the receipt. However, Aunt Natsuhi entered that room. So if Grandfather had left through the window or been thrown out, she could have been able to lock the window before escaping. Or like my theory, Grandfather could have hidden until the receipt was gone and left the room later. Basically, the door can be defeated with a handful of desperate tricks. In that sense, you can't really call this one a closed room either.
And now we have the door sealed with a door chain. Finally, we have to give up. The window, the door, everything had been locked. It was a perfect closed room. The first hadn't been a closed room because everyone could, have, could be suspected. The second hadn't been a closed room because I not we could be suspected. But this time, no one can be suspected. This was a perfect closed room because the door chain formed a seal that blocked everyone equally well. In that case, did the culprit carry, the, carry out the crime without entering the room? With some method from outside the room? Good point. Even though the chain makes it impossible to open wide enough for a person to fit through, you can still open it, you can still open it a small crack. Did the culprit knock on the door, make them peer out before attacking them? Wait, am I missing something? Yeah, you are. If Aunt Ava's body had been lying right next to the door, then it might have been possible. But she was on the bed in the back of the room. And Uncle Hideyoshi was even in the bathroom. Looking from the crack in the door, you can't even see, you couldn't even see them. And you couldn't reach them with your hands either. Damn it, it's all useless, I don't have a clue! Someone was tugging softly in my sleeve. It was Maria. Satisfied? What do you mean, satisfied? Battler, since you didn't want to suspect any of your relatives, you made a wish. Saying you wanted the culprit to be Beatrice, right? Well, Beatrice granted that wish. Just as you asked, she did something that was completely impossible for a human to make you believe in. For completely impossible for a human to make you believe that in the witch. And now you're complaining. How selfish. I'm sorry, that's funny. She was talking all that shit. And it's like, ouch! <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. Yo, what's all that shit you was talking? What's all that shit you was talking? Ah! <laughs> I tapped Mario, who was laughing unpleasantly, on the head with my fist. Sure. Thanks for granting that wish. That just now was a thank you, and also to teach you to stop laughing when it's inappropriate. More importantly, tell me. There was another mysterious scribble on the door to Aunt Eva and Uncle Hideyoshi's room. Was that another magic circle? Stop fucking laughing! That one had a really memorable and characteristic design, so I'd hoped you'd at least know what it was. I don't know, which is why I'm letting you take the credit. Quit whining and explain. You sure are violent, Battling. I won't tell you if you're too mean, get it? <laughs> Beat that bitch up! Beat that bitch up! Beat the fuck out that bitch! I'll say it, I'll say it, stop hitting me! That's the first magic circle of the moon. The Tsukihime? What does it mean? What is his magic circle's effect? What does the Hebrew writing mean? Those words are from the Old Testament, Psalms 107 verse 16. For he has broken grates of brass and cuts through bars of iron. This magic circle has two effects. First, it can open a door regardless of which method it had been used to lock it. That sure is convenient. So you're saying they're trying to make it look like they're a witch because this closed room has a door that can't be opened without relying on magic. And the other effect? When you're blocked by unopenable doors in all directions, it opens a door. By using it in a difficult situation, it gives you a solution you hadn't even thought of until then. Generally speaking, you receive the powers of observation and discernment, inspiration and intuition. Beatrice is trying to provoke you. This is no way lowly humans like Battler could figure out how this door was open. Okay, good work. Shut the fuck up. Sounds great. I'll accept this challenge from the witch. Maria. Things like witches and demons don't exist in this world. Someone killed father and mother. I don't know whether that was someone I know or not. But either way, it was definitely a human. 
Yeah, but how? How did they reach those two through that crack in the door? It couldn't have been more than 10 centimeters wide. At any rate, I can hardly stand the stench. What in the world could it be? It's another fucking body. Kanon and Kuwasawa had gone on ahead, realized the smell wasn't coming from the kitchen even before they arrived there. That was because they noticed an even thicker wave of stench rising up from the stairs leading to the basement, which they passed on their way to the kitchen. The boiler room. I wonder if there's something wrong with the boiler again. Those stairs led to the underground boiler room. The mansion's boiler was old and in poor condition. Both of them had witnessed problems with the boiler on several occasions, but they had never smelled the boiler bleaching out of stench like this before. Please don't tell me my goat is dead. Not my goat. Anybody but my goat, Kenzo. You can take anyone, but don't take Kenzo, please. Y'all already killed all my goats. Don't kill my number one. Slam. <laughs> what was that sound? The thing they heard from the basement was definitely the sound of a door closing. Kumasawa had phrased it as a question, but she already knew it couldn't be anything else. Kumasawa was so surprised at that sound that her knees gave way yet again and she cowered. After all, at that very moment, no one could have been in the boiler room. Just a few seconds ago, everyone had been crowded together around Ava and Hideyoshi. So who caused the sound of a door closing just now? Kanon! After taking a second to sort out the situation, Kanon ran down towards the basement. Since they heard the sound of a door closing just now, and there was no sign of anyone coming upstairs. The person who closed the door had to be inside the boiler room now. If the boiler room had been a dead end, Kanon wouldn't have rushed in so hastily. But Kanon was a servant, so he knew. There was two entrances to the boiler room. One that opened to the mansion and one that opened to the courtyard. If he didn't chase them now, they might slip away. Komisawa reached the same conclusion long after Kanon did. But she couldn't let him go alone. If the thing in the boiler room was the culprit, an opponent who had easily killed six adults in the first murder, then no matter how Kanon confronted them, he wouldn't be a match. Of course, with this argument, even if Kumasawa joined in, it wouldn't change anything. At any rate, after the delay, Kumasawa decided that she mustn't let Kanon go alone as she rushed down the stairs. At that time, Kanon was already in the boiler room. The boiler room's characteristic damp heat tormented him. It had always been an unpleasantly smelling and hot place. And on top of that, the room was full of that horrible stench, which made Kanon feel like he was going to be sick. There was no doubt that this room was a source. In that case, Kanon should have been searching for where the smell was coming from. However, Kanon kept gazing straight forward as he grabbed a hatchet from a tool shelf just off the side of the door. He hadn't stretched out his hand because he'd wanted a hatchet. He had wanted to grab a weapon, any weapon. Why? Kanon gazed into the darkness, where the naked light bulb couldn't pierce. Then he answered. In roulette, you bet on a number, or the, you bet on a number, or the colors red or black, vying for a payoff. However, low-risk bets like black and red only offer a similarly low payoff. The words coming from Kanon's mouth were swallowed up by the darkness. The darkness suddenly started to swirl, glittering. Oh shit. The witch. It was such a fantastical scene. Golden, sparkling butterflies that hid in the shadows all over the boiler room flapped their wings, twinking beautifully, and gathered in the darkness, disappearing. Kana continued speaking, directing his words at the darkness as it swallowed the butterflies up. But as the butterflies gathered in the darkness, they probably, they perhaps, probably, no, they would certainly laugh. But Kana continued to speak without faltering in the slightest. 
However, if you bet on something with a lower probability, your payoff increases proportional to the risk. The master caused succeeding despite an astronomical risk, a miracle, and caused the astronomical payoff gain as a result magic. I have no interest in what kind of magic you and the master were seeking when you spun that roulette, but you forgot something. You forgot that in roulette, there's either there's a pocket that's neither black nor red. Roulette is a special pocket called O, zero, which means that the house takes everything in certain variants of the game. This means that all the coins bet on the table will be swept up just as though everyone has forfeit. I set my heart on just one thing. I decided that if Shannon were to be killed and I was left alive, I'd sacrifice his life of mine and bring this roulette of yours to ruin. This isn't one of the master's rules, and it certainly isn't one of yours. I made this rule myself. I'm not furniture anymore. I'm the zero on your roulette. Don't get fucked up, Kanon. Kanon, don't get fucked up. Don't get fucked up, Kanon. Kanon's face twisted with humiliation. It was clear that his defiance against his own weakness was being ridiculed somehow. Even Beatrice saying like, don't get fucked up, little nigga. You can't touch me. You can't, you, hold on. You ain't gonna shoot it, pussy. Uh, little nigga's not gonna shoot his gun. That fuck, that stacks fucking mean. I, I forgot how it go. Kanon's brow creased even further in a fierce expression that he'd never shown to anyone appeared on his face. The hand grasping the hatchet was shaking. His sweat became drops which slid downward. It was clear that the emotion causing Kanon's hand to shake wasn't just anger. However, Kanon suppressed that emotion. I won't let your words lead me astray again. This is where the demon's roulette ends. Wait another thousand years in hell for your next summoner. Don't get fucked up. Don't get fucked up, Kanon. When Kanon raised the hatchet and tried to dive into the darkness, the darkness started laughing at his dumbass. It laughed like hell at the courage as if it was vulgar, lazy, futile, stupid, idiotic, and meaningless. Don't get fucked up, Kanon. Scared the fuck out of me, I'm not gonna lie. Did Kanon get fucked up? Kanon, his hands is still held aloft. Could it take another step after that? With a clang, the hatchet that he'd been grasping fell and rolled on the floor. And following that, with a pair of thuds, Kanon's knees hit left and right. The hand which looked like it was trying to catch the sky now, the hatchet had been dropped gradually lower, landing on his chest. Then his other hand did the same. Kanon got fucked up. Right there, a handle with the demon-shaped design was buried into his chest. The same type of weapon that had been stabbed into Ava and Hideyoshi's foreheads was in Kanon's chest. <laughs> Kanon was curled up in anguish, fresh blood dribbling from the corner of his mouth. It was makeup too extreme for Kanon's white skin. I told him not to get fucked up. Around this scene, the glittering gold butterflies danced through the darkness, mesmerizing. It was a beautiful, beautiful dance, a funeral march of tribute, ridicule and contempt for a single boy's self-sacrifice. Kanon had already been prepared for his own death, but although he could do nothing but accept the death he had received, he attempted one last measure of resistance. He grasped the handle of the weapon sticking into his chest with both hands and gritting his teeth with an acute, unearthly pain, he pulled it out. Oh, that bitch hurt. For only a moment, a bright red spray gushed out. It made an unpleasant bloop sound. It probably resembled the sound of Kanon's soul as it was sucked into the swamp of the dead. Kanon 
Ganon! Someone! Kumasawa screamed at an incomprehensible sight in front of her. Kanon was lying in a pool of blood. Kumasawa's heart was a complete mess. Oh, what a horrible fate. He wouldn't have been killed if I, if I had been with him. Oh, what incredible luck. If I had been with him, I might have been killed too. As she screamed, her expression was filled with complete confusion, and all the muscles in her face were pulled up, almost as though she was smiling while crying. But no one could have made a fun of an expression like this. What is it, Kumasawa? Answer me, Kumasawa! The first one to dash in was Natsuhi holding the rifle. Battler and Genji dashed in after her. Normally, they probably would have started discussing the origin of the violent stench filling the boiler room. But after they saw Kanan, who was laying on the ground as if he were drowning in an ocean of his own blood, the stench wasn't important anymore. Answer me! Genji, bring Dr. Nanjo here! Natsui realized that even though Kanan was on the verge of death, he was still conscious, so she sent Genji to get the doctor. Natsui, holding the rifle aloft, faced the darkness in the center of the boiler room and shouted, Who's hiding over there? Come out quietly! If you don't come out of there, I will shoot without mercy! We need light! Uh, Natsui, let's light him up! Battler, thinking quickly, took a large flashlight from the tool shelf alongside the door and used its light to cut through the darkness Natsui was glaring into. But the light only shone on mechanical looking piping in the door. The door had been left open a small crack and it was obvious that someone had left there through there in a hurry. <laughs> uh, Natsui, where does that door go? Genji! Where does that door lead to? The, the courtyard. Like hell, I'll let you get away, you damn bastard! Battle let out a war cry as he slammed into the door. Cool air from outside suddenly rushed in. There were some thin, rough stairs leading up. Battler ran up there shouting, Wait, Battler! It's dangerous to be on your own right now! Natsuhi was always also rushing up the stairs, chasing after Battler. They were in the courtyard. The courtyard of the mansion had been built strictly for lighting purposes, so it wasn't a very elegant place. Besides, it was surrounded on all sides. The air was calm and completely undisturbed, even though they could hear the sound of the strong winds. There was only a gentle, sorrowful rain as he ran through the cold and scattered raindrops. Dashing up the stairs into the courtyard, Battle looked in every direction. Of course, the odds of him finding a suspicious silhouette just standing around nonchalantly were pretty much zero. Battler spun, looking all around. He turned again and again. He kept spinning until he almost lost his sense of direction. He prayed that he would see the culprit somewhere in the scenery, but there was no chance. All he saw as he spun was more and more of the mansion's heartless walls and windows. Furthermore, there were two entrances into the mansion from the courtyard and neither of them were locked. Because the courtyard couldn't be entered from outside the mansion, the doors had been built without locks. He didn't know which one they had left through. He had to give up. Battler pounded the wall with his fist, swearing. Battler! You mustn't run ahead by yourself! Battler. Battler pressed his forehead against the wall, which he scratched at with his fingernails as he cried. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! On Avon, Uncle Hideyoshi! And now Kana? You killed a full six people! And that wasn't enough, you saw you had to kill three more? Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? On Avon, Hideyoshi were always kind and fun. I just met Kanon yesterday, but I'm sure I'd have gotten a lot along with them. Why did you kill them? Why? Why? You know, when people die, they don't come back to life again, right? They aren't gonna quickly sprout up again like bamboo shoots! Why did you kill them? Why? Why? <laughs> Battler was a boy who could understand the feelings of pain and regret in a person's heart. So he cried with all his strength. 
Nansu, who had always thought of Battler as a frank person, was a little surprised to find he had this delicate side. And at the same time, she understood how easily hurt the heart of a young person could be, so she held him. It's alright. I would definitely protect you, George, Maria, and Jessica. As a mother, and as the representative of the Ashura Mia family. Battle after sobbing in Anasui's chest for a while, wiped his tears with a bitter smile, as though he had been like that the whole time, and tried to appear as though he'd cried more than enough already. Anyway, let's go back down for now. Protecting ourselves is a higher priority than finding the culprit. Tomorrow, the boat will arrive, the will arrive. After that happens, the police will come, and everything should be brought to light. There's no way the Cobra can escape this island, no matter how much they struggle. That's right. When the police come, when the seagulls cry, the crime will be solved. But for some reason, Battler felt a slight sense of uneasiness, as if the seagulls would never cry again. That couldn't be true. When the typhoon passes, surely the lively seagulls will return to the harbor again. I returned to the boiler room along with Aunt Natsuhi and told everyone weekly that we hadn't found anything. We heard that Dr. Nanjo and George had carried Khan onto the servant room. The servant room had a first aid kit in a sink and could apparently function as a nurse's office. Kumasawa and Jessica had accompanied them. Stains from Kanon's blood remained on the floor. Judging by the large amount of blood lost in the ruthless shape of the weapon that had fallen carelessly to the ground, I figured that Dr. Nanjo's treatment would probably end in vain. That weapon was doubtlessly the same type that had been stuck in the uncle and Aunt Ava and Uncle Hideyoshi's foreheads. But wait, isn't the demonic design on the handle a little different? There seemed to be small, small differences on that part. Still, as far as the overall shape was concerned, the weapons were all the same type. Though it had seemed brutal, we left the weapons stuck in an Aunt Ava and Uncle Hideyoshi to preserve the crime scene. But this was the first time we were able to have a full view of the entire weapon. As we had expected, the weapon was not bladed like a knife, it was shaped like an ice pick, or rather a thin stake. And it had a spiral shaped pattern, sort of like a drill. And it looked like something that could be driven into the hearts of human sacrifices in some demonic ritual. Including the handle, it was 25 centimeters long. Half of that was a stake shaped part, which was stained in a deep red blood. The full length of this blood-stained knife made it clear just how deeply it must have penetrated into Kanon's chest. But Aunt Natsuhi and the rest didn't even look at the weapon, and instead stood in front of the incinerator where the horrible stench was emanating from. They must have dragged it out. Dragged out that thing which had been burning in the furnace. It was still smoldering and kept sending out dense waves of that unpleasant, awfully unpleasant smell. Genji and Maria stared down at it. Anatsui couldn't stand to look directly at it. She kept shaking her head, her back to it. I thought nothing could surprise me after everything that's happened. But this is... Uh. I stood there for a while, moaning with the rising urge to vomit. The true source of that unearthly stench was a scorched corpse that had been cooking inside the incinerator. Okay, I figured that. But who the fuck died? No way you killed my goat. You didn't kill my goat. The clothes, the surface of the body and the hair were all hideously burned. That grotesque corpse was in a state where not the face nor the age nor even the gender could be guessed at. But when I thought about it calmly, I realized that a corpse appearing at this time could only be one person. It was grandfather who had disappeared that morning and whose whereabouts had been unknown. I believe it is most likely the master. I agree that he would pass away in such a state. It's heartrending. But is there any proof that this corpse really is grandfather? It's burnt so black you can't even tell what sex it is. Battler, look at the feet. Anasui with her handkerchief over her mouth and her eyes averted, 
pointed and told me to look at the burnt corpse's feet. Notice how there are six toes on each foot. Ah. You're right. Just as Genji had said, there were six toes on each foot. Each individual toe had looked so normal in its line that I hadn't noticed. The master was born with six toes on both of his feet. Consequently, the master was entrusted with the revival of the Ushiramiya family. I have heard this since long ago. Cases of poly, polydactyly were common in the Ushiramiya family. It's probably hereditary. Literally means many fingers. Because of a little mistake by God when the person is born, one of their toes or fingers split into two, and the total number increases. But a big deal isn't usually made of polydactyly in the world at large. That's because it isn't a disease, it's something people are born with. So while they're still babies, and at about the time they turn one year old, they can be taken to a hospital to give a surgery to make them normal. Even a child with polydactyly can be treated before they become aware, so they might not even remember it themselves. By the way, seeing that there's a possibility for this to occur in one out of every 2,000 babies, even though it's not usually seen, it isn't that rare at all. Speaking of which, I think Uncle Hideyoshi mentioned something to me a long, t long ago, something about how even Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the man who unified Japan at the end of the Sengoku period, had six fingers on one arm. According to Aunt Natsuhi, among the many Ushiramiya family heads, the one most praised for their wisdom all had polydactyly. Because of that, when Grandfather was born, his relatives were all excited at the thought that he might become another wise leader. And when the leading relatives all died in the Great Kanto earthquake, it was apparently argued that Grandfather should be the one to restore the family, because of the auspicious sign of his birth. If Grandfather hadn't disliked his position as a head so much, this sixth toe would have, probably, would have probably been lucky for him. Come to think of it, I've heard about some country where it's believed people with polydactyly should be treated as gods and revered. This is besides the point, but it's fairly common in mystery novels for a corpse to be burned to hide its identity. But I guess that in Grandfather's case, just toasting him wouldn't be enough. And Grandfather's body was not simply burnt. It was just like Aunt Ava and Uncle Hideyoshi and the thing had been stabbed into Kanon's chest. One of those demon ice pits was stuck into his forehead. You mean? The head's ring is not on his finger. So the letter last night was telling the truth. Father would probably be horribly disappointed. Natsu would let her head droop and closed her eyes tightly. This room had also become a vital crime scene for us to hand over to the police. It was decided that we would leave Grandfather's corpse here and lock the room, sealing it. It isn't clear when Grandfather's corpse started burning in the incinerator. Since according to Genji, the strength of the fangs hadn't been that strong, the body must have started burning a long time ago. So that stench could slowly creep out of the furnace and fill the room bit by bit, eventually pouring out and climbing up the staircase. Putting aside whether he was rare or well done, Grandfather had been brought out, killed, and burned, even though he had started a, even though he had started out locked away in the closed room created by his auto lock. There's probably no doubting this. However, according to Genji, the boiler room is usually locked. The possibility that someone outside of our group had snuck in and committed the crime was overwhelmingly high. And there's a good chance that the person was walking around with something like a master key. After all. The doors and windows throughout the mansion had been checked, but despite that, the corporal was able to strut around the mansion freely. Does this crime confirm that a 19th person exists? There's still that contradiction, either trying to tout their existence without ever showing themselves once. Along with Kyrie's chessboard theory, I've been using this contradiction to deny the existence of a 19th person. By spinning the chessboard around once more, the very fact that this crime, the very fact that this crime makes it perfectly obvious that a 19th person exists, means that the existence of a 19th person is even less plausible. 
as long as that 19th person has to show themselves in front of us. If the culprit can get Grandfather out through the door sealed by the receipt, if they could kill Aunt Ava and Uncle Hideyoshi from the other side of the door sealed by a chain, and they could possibly go as far to create a fictional 19th person through strange tricks and devices. If we still want to believe that the culprit is among the 18, then the list of suspects has grown very short. The four of us kids, Aunt Natsuhi, Genji, Kumasawa, and Dr. Nanja, one of these people has to be the culprit. Wait, we can't be sure of that. Just a second ago, we, were, we started doubting whether the corpse he was actually grandfather's, right? Maybe we can think of the other bodies in the same way. For example, the first six all had their faces horribly smashed. Some of the bodies had even kept enough of their face for us to confirm who they were. But that old bastard, for example, had lost his entire face, as though the whole thing had been neatly peeled off. We only figured out which bodies was which by their clothes and surroundings. Did the Cobra prepare a fake body beforehand and alter it to make it look like they died, even though they were hiding somewhere after committing the crime? It may sound ridiculous, but it, be, but it wouldn't be a possible trick to pull off. It's too early to give in to this 19th person. No, this witch. Battle or you're dragging it. Mario, you mustn't stare so fixedly anymore. Come on, Battler Come on, Battler 2. I'm worried about Kanon's condition and we mustn't remain in a place like this any longer than necessary. Let us return. Mario didn't go out with everyone else, but remained in the boiler room. The thing she was staring fixedly at probably wasn't Grandfather's body, but the demon's ice pick sticking out of his forehead. It was probably the sort of item that an enthusiast couldn't bear to ignore. I tapped on her on the head. Hey, Maria. What's Beatrice after? Is it all of our lives? <laughs> Beatrice will revive very soon. At that time, none shall be left alive. How could you laugh at something like that? Do you think you're the only one who's safe? Why don't you feel like you're in danger? Why aren't you scared? Beatrice made a promise. She said she's going to take me to the Golden Land. It's a wonderful place where you have no obligations, everyone's always together, and everyone is always nice to everyone else. I'm looking forward to it. That time will come very soon now. Oh, I don't like that. Just what kind of person is Maria? I only know what Maria was like six years ago when she was three. She was once pure and obedient, a good kid. There's new Maria six years later and the Maria I knew didn't seem to fit together. Just who is she? This witch who calls herself Maria. To Maria who absence abstinently believes in the witch. This series of insolvable crimes has proved that the witch actually exists. Every time something occurs that would be difficult for a human, it becomes a little harder for us, the rest of us to not believe in the Beatrice. It must be an intense pleasure for Maria to see her relatives who once firmly denied the witch's existence start acknowledging that the witch's existence one by one. Is that why she's in high spirits? <sighs> Maria, let me ask one more time. You'll probably answer the same anyway, but I'll just ask one more time. Yesterday you were given a letter in the Rose Garden. Who gave it to you? Like I said, Beatrice! Battler still doesn't believe. Maria only repeated what she had already said. Maria met with the 19th person, the witch. Was that really a 19th person? Or did one of the 18 just get her to say that? All that's certain is that Maria has been with the rest of us constantly, has always had an alibi, hasn't done anything suspicious. She's simply overjoyed at being made Beatrice's messenger, and certainly isn't the 19th person. Supposedly. That's right. 
I wonder what's written in the letter we picked up in Aunt Natsuhi and Uncle Hideyoshi's room. Aunt Natsuhi should still have it with her. Bro, get this big ass clock out my fucking face. Found on the bed of the guest room inside the mansion with a weapon resembling an ice pick sticking out on her forehead. Mmm, she doesn't. She didn't have the little second one. Found in the bathroom of the same guest room that Ava was found in. Like Ava, there was a weapon resembling an ice pick sticking out of his forehead. You can't see either of them by looking through the gap of the, of the door while the chain is set. You can't see them so you can't reach them. Hey, how could a human possibly kill them? Oh, I see, and the blood marks are supposed to signify where they were injured at. I see. Burning the incinerator with a weapon resembling an ice pick sticking out of his forehead. The old sorcerer's wish vanished before it could be granted. He always knew that this was one possible resort of his risky gamble. Damn, I'm on go. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, or read a all tap into the next one. Fuck. I think I might just never play this game again. Like, they killed my goat. Like, if Kenzo's not in the game, like, what point is it to play? <laughs> I'm fucking around. But I gotta see what, I gotta see happens. I might, I'm not gonna lie, bro. The way this shit is going, I might fuck around and, like, lay it later on again like shit this is going so fantastically crazy but peace out i love y'all step into the next one man